Um, we have two topics today. One is just the mosquito observation update, and the other one will be Dr. Parker's presentation. For those of you who have been keeping track of how many mosquito observations we have made since we've started the Mission Mosquito and the Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper, we're at 36,655 observations, which is about a 300 observation increase from last month. So I think there might be a few SEAS interns who are contributing to that. So thank you very much for getting those numbers up for us. And I'd like to jump right in to give Dr. Parker all the time that she needs. And I'd like to introduce her. She's an eco epidemiologist, which means she studies the intersection between ecology and disease. Her research focuses on mosquitoes and the diseases they transmit in human dominated landscapes. Since we do not have vaccines for many of the viruses spread by mosquitoes, controlling mosquito populations is the best way to prevent disease transmission. She looks at how mosquito species distribution and abundance varies based on how humans have altered the environment and how humans' knowledge, attitudes, and mosquito control practices affect potential for mosquito-borne diseases to spread. Dr. Parker then uses this information to create outreach tools to work to reduce mosquito populations. Her research allows her to work with her community partners and the public. So with that, Dr. Parker, I'll stop sharing and you have the, you have the floor. Awesome, thank you for that introduction. Um, and at any time, feel free to put questions into the chat. I have the chat pulled up so I can stop and an answer your questions. Um, Edward, I'm a weird epidemiologist. So I do study disease, but I study it from a mosquito perspective. So when I, what I do is I actually really look at ecology of mosquitoes and what humans do to impact where we find mosquitoes to try to stop diseases before we have an outbreak. So today what we're gonna talk about is some mosquito traps and everything you need to know about how to do mosquito experiments at home. So um, here's the overview of what we're gonna talk about today. So I'll go over some um, mosquito ecology, some basic information about mosquitoes. We'll do some um, just some brief information about how to identify the three main groups of mosquitoes that you'll probably see. Then we're gonna talk about some research that some of my students and I have done in my lab. And uh, Dr. Lowe can talk about some really cool traps that we were going to try to use in the future in my lab and that have been used um, down in Mexico. Then we'll end with talking about how do you design a research project and talk about different ideas of what you can do. And then we'll take time for any questions that you have. But like I said, if you have questions during the talk, feel free to throw them in the chat and then I can answer them as we go. So the first question is, why study mosquitoes? So mosquitoes are the most dangerous animals on the planet, more dangerous than sharks or any other scary type animal that you think, oh, it could attack humans. And the reason mosquitoes are the most dangerous animals on the planet is because they spread a wide range of diseases. And a lot of these diseases, we don't have a vaccine to prevent us from getting them. So if you get them, your body just has to be able to deal with it and fight it off. And so some of the diseases include malaria, dengue, chikungunya, Zika. In the United States, you've probably heard of West Nile virus. And these are all diseases that primarily impact humans, but some of these diseases also impact animals that we care about. So West Nile can infect horses. Um, Eastern equine encephalitis, where I'm at in Kentucky, is a big one we're worried about because it can impact our racehorses. And your dogs can get dog heartworm from mosquitoes. And I guess I'd say, Joseph, that maybe humans are the most dangerous animals on the planet. Other than humans, mosquitoes kill the most humans. I'd say that. That's a good point. And what we're seeing right now with mosquitoes is we're seeing an increase in the number of diseases that are spread by mosquitoes due to invasive species. So these are species of mosquitoes that are moved from the place they're native to to a new location that they weren't at before. 
And that way, if that particular mosquito can transmit a certain disease and we move it to a new place, then we can see the spread of that disease in the new location. Climate change is going to increase the locations that we see these mosquitoes existing, especially for our more tropical and subtropical species they'll be able to live in much broader areas than they could previously, which could then impact the diseases we might be coming in contact with. And then urbanization. So some of our mosquito species, especially in one group that spreads some really nasty viruses, are really, really, really good at living in human-dominated landscapes like urban or suburban areas. And that's one of my main focuses of research is how does what we do with the landscape really impact what mosquitoes we see and where? So mosquitoes, I think, I don't like mosquitoes. I wanna get rid of them, but I think they're really, really fascinating creatures. There's over 3000 species of mosquitoes worldwide. We have 176 known species of mosquitoes in the United States alone. There's over 88 species in Africa, for example. So there's tons of different types of mosquitoes. And not every mosquito species transmits diseases, but we still wanna get rid of them because who wants to get bit by mosquitoes? I don't. So mosquitoes have this really cool complex life cycle. So when we think of a mosquito, we normally think of the mosquito that's flying around in the air, trying to bite us, they're annoying. But for most of their juvenile life or for their juvenile life stage, they actually live in water. So um, we have our adult stage that's in, in the air and then the females will have to take a blood meal. So only our female mosquitoes drink blood. The male mosquitoes don't bite us. They don't care about us. Their main job is to find a female and mate. The females have to blood feed so that they have enough nutrients to make their eggs because that's a really energy nutrient intensive process. So once the female takes a blood meal and digests it, she lays her eggs in some sort of aquatic habitat. And we'll talk about these habitats in a little bit. So her eggs are in some sort of water and then they hatch and the larvae go through multiple stages where they get larger and larger at each stage. And when they're in the water, they're eating decaying plants and animal matter and bacteria that's also eating the decaying plants. And because insects have an exoskeleton, their, their skeletons on the outside of their body, they have to molt to get bigger. And so they'll go through four stages as larvae. Once they're ready to turn into adults, they have to go into this pupil stage, which I think looks kind of like little sea dragons. And you can think of this, if you think about a caterpillar has to go into a cocoon before it can turn into a butterfly. That's what the pupil stage is for the mosquitoes. So that's when they're switching from their worm looking larval stage into their adult stage. And here's some pictures down at the bottom of the slide. Here are all a bunch of little larvae. Here's a whole thing of pupae. And this is a bunch of adults that we captured and killed to identify. So we're gonna talk now about the three major groups of mosquitoes that you'll probably come into contact with. And then I'll talk about a fourth one because it's my favorite. So the three main groups are Aedes, Anopheles, and Culex. And these are the most common groups that you'll find around the world. And they're also the three main groups that we're concerned about when we're thinking about mosquito-borne diseases. So I'm gonna go through each one of these individually. So our first group we're gonna talk about are the 80s. And 80s, um, we'll talk for each of these three groups about their eggs, the larvae, and the adults, and then a few important species. So for 80s, 80s lay single eggs on the side of containers. And so if we look at this popsicle stick here, all of these little black dots are actually single eggs that a female laid. And so if we look up here on the top of the popsicle stick, there's about four or five eggs all in a row. Those are probably laid by the same female. This is important when we're thinking about the different types of habitats we're gonna find our mosquitoes in because 80s females can lay one egg in one container and fly to a different container. And if it's a better habitat, 
they can lay 50 eggs and then fly to another container and lay three eggs. So they're gonna be laying their eggs in multiple different habitats before they have to take another blood meal to make more eggs. And we can see down in this figure below that we have, these are some eggs that are zoomed in. They, the eggs look kind of like little grains of rice. The larvae of 80s sit perpendicular to the surface of the water and they have what's called a siphon. And the siphon is, I can draw, The siphon is right here. And you can kind of think of it like a butt straw. It's where they're breathing oxygen. So the mosquitoes, even though the larvae are in the water, they still have to breathe oxygen from the air. And so the 80s breathe through this tube called a siphon, or my research students call it a butt straw because they think that's really funny. And so because they're breathing through that tube, they're gonna sit perpendicular to the water surface and their siphon is very short compared to other mosquito species. The adults are usually dark. So in this case, this mosquito that we have here, um, this is Aedes albopictus. It is the Asian tiger mosquito. I picked it because it's, I think, one of the coolest looking Aedes mosquitoes. Um, not all of them are this dark in color, but they're darker in color and they usually have stripes on their legs. Like we can see here, there's many stripes. Um, here's another species, um, a different species of 80s. And you can see, again, they still have these stripes on their legs, even though these stripes aren't as obvious. And there's two major vectors of um, viral pathogens. So 80s transmit a lot of different diseases um, that are viruses. And the two main species we're concerned about globally is the Asian tiger mosquito, 80s elopictus, which we can see here, and this mosquito, you probably have it around you because it's all basically all over the world. And these are the ones that will fly around you in the middle of the day and they don't care. Most other mosquitoes aren't gonna fly around in the middle of the day to try to bite you, but the Asian tiger mosquito will. And then the other mosquito that we're concerned about is Aedes aegypti, which this is a male pictured here. And this is the yellow fever mosquito. And just like Aedes albopictus, it's able to transmit many different diseases. So do all 80s adults have stripes? So that's a great question. So yes, they're going to have stripes. Sometimes it's hard to see the stripes if you can't look at them pretty closely, like under a microscope. Um, some species like Aedes japonicus, they actually have golden colored stripes on them. And so sometimes it's hard to see that gold on their darker brown, almost black bodies. So you can usually assume if there's, if you can't see stripes, it's probably not an 80s, um, but that's not always the case. And the other thing that can happen is if we look at this male in this picture, he doesn't have a lot of his scales on his abdomen anymore. And sometimes those can fall off. Um, so if you're handling the adults a lot, their scales can fall off. So you might lose some of those stripes that you would normally see. Okay, so are female mosquitoes attracted to a specific scent or blood? So some research shows that mosquitoes might be more attracted to people who have O-type blood, but there's many different factors that the females are sensing in the environment when they're deciding on who or what to bite. So some species have types of organisms that they prefer to feed on. Um, the next group, uh, one of the groups we'll talk about today, Culex mosquitoes, for example, they prefer to feed on birds. Other species are less picky, um, but if we're thinking about what makes them attracted to humans, so it can be the types of food or things you're drinking make different scents that you give off. And insects like mosquitoes, they don't have a nose like we do. Instead, they use their antennae, and if we look at this female here, she has these little hairs on her antennae, and the males have many, many more hairs. They use those hairs to actually smell. So antennae are like noses for insects. And so they can use their antennae to smell different chemical cues that we're giving off in the environment. If you get a lot of mosquito bites around your ankles, that means that you have stinky feet because they did a study and the bacteria that grows between the toes, if you have stinky feet, is similar to the bacteria in Limburger cheese, which is a really smelly, stinky cheese and mosquitoes are really attracted to that. So if you have a lot of bites around your ankles, 
it's because you have that bacteria growing between your toes. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's just natural. Um, there's some studies that show um, people who are pregnant might be more attractive, usually because they're giving off more body heat and they're uh, exhaling out more carbon dioxide. And so those are different things that the mosquitoes will look for. They can also detect a lighter and darker uh, colors as well. So that is another way that they come, they can come to find a host. So have mosquitoes always been a global species or were they originally native to a specific continent? So that's a great question. And I don't think we know the answer to that. So we have many species of mosquitoes that are very similar to each other. Um, and by the, just from movement of animals over time, because mosquitoes are a really old group of insects. Um, they're actually, mosquitoes are flies. So like similar to a house fly, they're closely related to flies, but mosquitoes are in a group called old world flies. And they've been around since the time of the dinosaurs. So we're not exactly sure where they originated from, but they are a global species now. They're found everywhere except for Antarctica. We even have some mosquitoes that live very far north in really cold regions and only come out for a very short period of time in the summers. Like up in Alaska, for example, or in northern Canada, some mosquito species come out only for about a month and they could be so heavy in the population, so many mosquitoes that they can actually ensanguinate or drink all the blood out of a caribou and it dies. Kind of crazy. So these are 80s. And then our next group of mosquitoes that we wanna talk about are, except for we wanna erase this, are the Anopheles mosquitoes. And Anopheles mosquitoes, just like the 80s mosquitoes, lay single eggs, so one at a time. But they're different because they lay their eggs on the surface of the water instead of on the sides of containers. And their eggs, as you can see in this picture here, have these little floaties on the side that help them stay up on the surface of the water. The larvae don't have a siphon, so they lay parallel to the surface of the water because they don't have that little straw to breathe air through. They just have to breathe just right through basically their butt, so no butt straw. And then the adults are kind of weird looking. They have much longer legs. They have an angular body shape, and they have some pretty cool patterns on their wings, which you can kind of see in this female in this picture. Um, these mosquitoes are the main vectors of malaria. We used to have malaria in the United States, but we don't anymore because we actually got rid of the disease. We do still have some species of Anopheles mosquitoes in the United States that can transmit malaria if we were to bring it back to the United States. So in Africa, our main um, vector of malaria is Anopheles gambiae, but there's many, many, many other vectors, uh, Anopheles vectors in Africa. If we're thinking about Central and South America, the American malaria mosquito, Anopheles darlingi, is the main vector. Um, in Asia, including India, we have Anopheles stemphysi, and then in the United States, the common malaria mosquito, Anopheles quadrimaculatus. But we have other mosquitoes as well, even in the United States, that can transmit malaria. All right, I'm going to get to that question about what is the best type of water to find larvae after we go through the next group, the next two groups of mosquitoes, and then we'll get to that question. So the last major group of mosquitoes that we, you, you'll come into contact with are the Culex mosquitoes. And Culex mosquitoes lay, instead of laying a single egg at a time, the females have to lay all their eggs at once. And so they lay egg rafts. So in this first picture here, we're zoomed in, oops, zoomed in on the egg rafts. So all these little dots are all single eggs and they're all stuck together. And the eggs float on the surface of the water. So in this container here, we have one, two, and then this is, these are two egg rafts. So there's four total egg rafts on the surface of this water. And just to give you an idea of how tiny they are, uh, that's on the tip of my fingers and I have tiny hands. Or here's the same egg raft on the tip of a paintbrush. So you can actually pick these egg rafts up just by putting a paintbrush underneath them or even a popsicle stick and then lifting up and then they'll sit right there and you can take them away with you. 
just like our 80s, the Culex species have a siphon. So they have the butt tube or butt straw here, but theirs is much longer um, and they tend to be a more brownish color as larvae. And they also like 80s sit perpendicular to the water. So if you ever see a mosquito sitting parallel to the water surface, just looking like it's floating underneath, right underneath the water, that's an Anopheles. And then the ones sitting perpendicular are most likely going to be 80s or QX. The female, uh, the adults are brown and boring. That's it. The QX are kind of boring mosquitoes. They're just brown. You could see here, here's a female and here's a male. They're just brown. But we care about the QX mosquitoes because they're the main vectors of West Nile virus. So um, some of the um, vectors are the northern house mosquito, Culex pipiens, the southern house mosquito, Culex quinquefasciatus, or the western encephalitis mosquito, Culex tarsalis. And we find all three of these species in the United States. And the main vector of West Nile in Africa is also Culex pipiens, because Culex pipiens is not native to the United States. It was actually brought over from Africa during the slave trade. So it's a mosquito that's been here a really long time. So just as a recap, since you might be coming into contact with these larvae, here's again, looking at them all together. So our 80s larvae sit perpendicular to the water like we see here, and they have a short siphon, so a short butt straw. The Anopheles, sit parallel to the water because they don't have that straw or tube to breathe through. So they just breathe right out of their butt. And then the Culex, like 80s, sit perpendicular to the water, but they have a much longer, skinnier siphon. So that's kind of what these three groups look like. Um, when you've been doing this a long time, like I have, I can actually look at these larvae and tell you if it's 80s, Anopheles, or Culex. If you can't do that right away, that's okay. I've been doing this a really long time. So great question, do all these mosquito species coexist or do they have different environmental preferences causing them to live in different climate zones? So yeah, so all these mosquitoes have different habitat requirements. So um, 80s aegypti, for example, the yellow fever mosquito has to be in tropical climates. So in the United States, we'll find it in Florida, and um, in Southern Texas, but nowhere else. But 80s albopictus is a subtropical mosquito. So we find it all the way up through most of the United States um, because it's able to tolerate our winters. So some mosquito species can tolerate winters, some can't. So that depends on where we find them. Um, also, these larvae are competing against each other in their habitats. And so some species are better competitors than others. And so that can influence what species of mosquito we're seeing. And then we do have seasonality for some of these mosquitoes. So some species might come out earlier in the summer if we have a place where we have four seasons. Some might come out later in the summer. Um, so that can change where we see them. And then the habitats we find them in can be different. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, 80s and Culex tend to be container breeding mosquitoes. So they tend to lay their eggs in container type habitats where the Anopheles tend to be floodwater or floodplain mosquitoes. So they'll, we'll find them in bigger bodies of water, but that's not always true. Okay, so is there a mosquito hierarchy? Does some mosquito species overpower the others? Yes. So we do see that with competition when the mosquito species are battling it out as larvae. Some are much better at getting food than the other ones. And so that's a huge area of mosquito ecology research. And that's some of the stuff that I look at in my research lab. So 80s elbow pictus, for example, is considered a superior competitor to most other container breeding mosquito species, which is not great because it can transmit a lot of nasty diseases that we don't want. And so that is something that we look at when we're looking at these different species. And why are only certain species carriers of specific viruses? Is there something preventing certain species from carrying specific diseases? Yeah, so for some of these diseases, well, for a lot of them, there's a very long evolutionary history with certain groups of mosquitoes. So West Nile, for example, is transmitted by Culex mosquitoes 
primarily. Culex mosquitoes prefer to feed on birds. Birds are the main host or the main organism that West Nile virus has to be in to complete its life cycle. And so the Culex mosquitoes, because they're biting the birds more often, they're more likely to get West Nile. And so West Nile virus has evolved to be able to be moved from one bird host to another through the Culex mosquitoes. Humans and horses are what are called dead end hosts. So West Nile doesn't want to be in us because if a mosquito bites me and I have West Nile, I can't give it back to the mosquito, which is bad for the virus because then the virus can't move to a new host. And so it's these evolutionary relationships that we see that really determine why certain species transmit certain diseases compared to other species. Why do Culex mosquitoes have a longer siphon than 80s? That's just how they evolved. I don't think that we know why, and it's not better or worse. It just kind of is how they are. How similar are the mosquitoes we have today to the ancient ones we find in fossilized amber, for example? So there's, they're similar, but there are major differences. Um, if we're thinking back to the time of the dinosaurs, there was a lot more oxygen on the planet than we have now. So that changed how a lot of insects, how big they could be, for example, um, and different things like that. So they're similar, but they're not gonna be identical. All right, so I'm gonna tell you about my favorite, my favoriteest of all time mosquitoes. This is my favorite mosquito, the elephant mosquito. So the elephant mosquito is called the elephant mosquito because it has this mouth part that curves down kind of like a trunk and they're big mosquitoes. The reason they're my favorite other than they're really pretty and they have this kind of metallic blue and gold coloration is that the larvae eat other mosquito larvae. So they're actually good mosquitoes. And so here's a picture of one um, eating a Culex mosquito larvae. And these larvae are big and red and they're very distinctive. You would know if you saw one. And so this is really cool because they can actually eat all the other mosquito larvae in a container. And because they're eating this protein rich food sources larvae, the females do not feed on our blood. So they don't bite us and they get rid of other mosquitoes. So this is my favorite. I always have to share it because I think it's so cool. But you won't see them a lot. They're not super common because the, they need to spread out through multiple habitats so that the larvae have enough food to eat. So I know there were a lot of questions about where do we find mosquitoes? So the mosquitoes that I study and the ones that you'll most likely look at if you decide to do a research project on mosquitoes are called container breeding mosquitoes. And in nature, we have many different types of container habitats that occur naturally. So it could be something like a tree hole like we see here, or here's one with, by the roots of the tree. And when it rains, water pools in the tree, in this tree hole. And there's lots of nutrients there because it's in a tree and leaves and things can fall in here. So there's lots of food for the larvae. But we have other uh, contain natural containers other than tree holes. We can have rock pools like this here, and even depressions in the ground, even something like a really small puddle like this is enough water for certain species of mosquitoes to develop. So that would be a natural container where a lot of these mosquitoes started to, you know, where they would normally lay their eggs if we, weren't living in a place that was dominated by humans. But humans are really, really, really good at making containers. And we're really bad at taking care of them in a lot of cases. So we have lots of different container type habitats. You can have tires, which I'll talk about on a study that we did last summer with tires. It could be something like a flower pot or a flower pot saucer, um, buckets like we see here, flowering, uh, watering cans, big containers like a rain barrel or a garbage can or a stormwater catch basin that holds water after it rains. They can look at all those leaves that are already about to fall in there. Tons of food resources. Clogged gutters are also a really great habitat for mosquitoes because there's usually a lot of nutrients. If your gutter's clogged, there's leaves and things keeping it from draining properly. 
but we can have really small container habitats too. This tarp with these puddles here had over 100 mosquito larvae in it that I collected. And even something like this corrugated downspout extension, those little V's can hold a little bit of water and that's enough for some mosquitoes to live in. And so we have this wide range of habitats from really, really large rain barrels to really, really small puddles and tarps. And we have artificial containers and then we have our naturally occurring containers. So there's a wide range of containers, habitats that mosquito larvae can develop in. And it's up to the females to decide which habitat's gonna be the best for their offspring. And that's one of the areas of research that we do in my lab is we look at what container habitats do females like? What is it about the container that makes it attractive so that we could figure out ways to try to reduce the most attractive container habitats in an area? Because controlling the containers is a lot easier than trying to control the adults that are flying around everywhere. The larvae are stuck in this container. So if we can get rid of these containers, we get rid of the larvae, and then they can't turn into adults. And just dumping it over into the ground, the water onto the ground is enough to get rid of that container. Those larvae will die. So I'm gonna talk about a study that we did last summer where we looked at what, how many mosquitoes and the different species of mosquitoes that we find in tires. And we looked in rural parks in very large non-human dominated landscapes, so very large natural areas, and urban parks which were smaller natural areas in a more urban built environment. So in this study, uh, we did this in Northern Kentucky because that's where I live. And we had 12 sites. We had five urban parks and seven rural parks. And we surveyed each site once a week from June through August. And we collected all the larvae and pupae from the tires. So these are some of my research students. Um, and so what we do to collect these is we actually use turkey basters. You can see some of them here. Uh, here's Lily, she's using a turkey baster here um, to suck up the water from the tires. And then we put it in these smaller Tupperware containers and use smaller little uh, pipettes to suck up the larvae and pupae and put them in a bag to bring them back to the lab. The larvae uh, we put in ethanol and then we identify and then the pupae we let emerge as adults and then we identify the adults because you can't tell the pupae apart. They all look like the same little sea dragons. And then we also put out two trap, two different types of traps by our tires to collect the adults. Because we wanted to see if the species of mosquitoes flying around, if all of them were choosing to lay their eggs in the tires or if they were saying, no, I don't like the tires, I'm gonna go somewhere else to lay my eggs. And then we identified all the mosquitoes that we got to species. So what is the maximum, oh, the maximum amount of survey sites? So there's not really a maximum. It's really how many can you feasibly do with the time and resources that you have? So the minimum we would want to do is three sites total. So then we have, in case one site's really bad or something, we still have at least two we can look at. Um, we were also only able to use five urban sites because that's how many parks that we were able to access um, in the city that we were doing this in. Yeah, does urbanization increase or decrease mosquito populations? That is a great question. It depends on the mosquitoes that we're looking at. So for this study, we were just looking at all mosquitoes. There are certain mosquitoes that were more likely to find in urban areas and some species were more likely to find in rural areas, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. So what did we find? So we collected 9,841 larvae and pupae from our tires last summer, and we identified all of them. Um, so whenever in science you see N equals, that's the number. So we, in this case, we had that many larvae and pupae. And if we look, we see that we have a range of different species that we found. So Aedes japonicus was the most common larval species that we found. Um, which is an invasive species that, had, that came into the United States a lot more recently than some of our other species. Um, we found Culex restuans, which is one of the native uh, Culex species we have here. It was a common species. Um, Aedes triceriatus, which is another native species. And then we had Culex pipians, 
and Aedes albopictus, just like Aedes japonicus, non-native species. And then we found a few other random species um, that accounted for a very small percent. And most exciting to me was that we did find the elephant mosquito um, at some of our sites. So that's this Toxorhynchites. Um, it was at a very small percentage, but I didn't expect to find it in our tires and we did. So that was really, really cool. And then for our adults, we collected 2,193 adults in our trap. So that was a lot. So total, we collected a lot and a lot we had to identify. Most of them were Culex restuans and pipians. And it says restuans slash pipians because we can't actually identify these two species looking at them under a microscope. So if we wanted to know which of these two species we were collecting, we'd have to send it off for genetic testing. And we didn't do that. So we had a lot of these species, um, a lot of Aedes japonicus, Aedes triceratus, Aedes albopictus, and then some other species. We actually did not collect any elephant mosquito adults. And I didn't expect us to because the traps we were using weren't targeting their their very special specific lifestyle. So we do see though that the species we're finding in our tires are the same as the species that we are that are flying around. So we know we're really capturing most of the mosquitoes in the area. So that's really cool. Okay, so modifying mosquito to lower the percentage of offspring. Yes. Okay. So um, what Edward's asking about is uh, genetically modified mosquitoes. So there's a few different things that uh, scientists are doing to mo genetically modify mosquitoes. One of them, one of the things that they're doing is they're actually working to make it so that they're, they're genetically modifying the male mosquitoes and releasing them. And when the females mate with these genetically modified males, the females only have male mosquitoes as offspring. And then those males mate with females and then those females only have male mosquitoes. And so they're genetically engineering them to just produce more and more males, which is great because the males don't blood feed. Because the males don't blood feed, they can't transmit any diseases to us. It's only the females that transmit diseases. So if we have all these males and not a lot of females, we're gonna hopefully reduce the chances of outbreaks of mosquito-borne diseases. So, it's an effective strategy for mass control. They've actually tried it in some uh, different places, usually on islands, so it's a more controlled study. And it does actually reduce over time the number of mosquitoes, and then we can reduce the number of diseases that are being transmitted. I don't know if we can engineer mosquitoes to spread medicine or a vaccine. That would be a lot trickier. Um, we do genetically um, engineer mosquitoes. There's a group in Australia who really works on this. There's a particular uh, bacteria called Wolbachia that actually can be put into mosquitoes. And then when they mate, they um, transfer it to their offspring and then it gets transferred to all the next successive generations. And that particular bacteria actually makes it so that the mosquitoes can can't transmit dengue virus, which is a really, really nasty disease to get. And so there are some things that we can do, but I'm not sure if it would be ethically okay to have mosquitoes spread medicine or vaccines because people wouldn't have given their consent for that. So do the mosquito larvae, larvae typically die by the time you've identified their species? So what we do is we actually put them in alcohol to kill them because it's really hard to identify a mosquito larvae that's like a little worm and it's wiggling around like crazy. So we actually kill them so that we can identify them. Also, we don't want them in the environment. So, you know, we're doing a favor to the public going to these parks. So would our environment survive without mosquitoes? Probably, we'd probably be okay without mosquitoes. I might not have as much work to do, but you know, um, so, you know, they, they have a place in the environment, um, but I think we'd be okay without them. Now, the different question is, could we eradicate them? I don't think we can get rid of mosquitoes. They are way too good at what they do. I think it would be really, really hard for us to eradicate them. Okay, have researchers ever introduced 
elephant mosquitoes to new environments to reduce the population of more harmful mosquitoes? Yes, and it has failed horribly. So the problem with the elephant mosquitoes, there's actually elephant mosquito species on every major continent. The problem is, is that the females only lay one or maybe two eggs per container habitat so that their offspring don't have to compete with each other for food resources, the other mosquito larvae. Because, the, because they're predators, they're at a lower density in nature than the other mosquito species. And so there's just not enough of them to actually do a good job of reducing the mosquito populations. So we would have to continually release elephant mosquitoes into the environment and that becomes very expensive. It would, if they could do it on their own, we release some once and then they could keep controlling the mosquitoes, that would be great. But so far that has not worked in any of the experiments that have been tried. These are all such great questions. So somebody asked, are there more mosquitoes in rural parks or urban parks? Hmm. Could they make a genetically modified elephant mosquito to lay more eggs? So it's not that she, if she lays more eggs or not, you would have to modify her to be okay with her some of her offspring dying. So she wants to have all of her offspring, all the eggs that she lays, emerge as adults. If she has too many eggs in the same container, they might not have enough larvae to feed on, and so then they might not have enough nutrients to turn into an adult. And so I think that would be pretty challenging, but uh, you, maybe that is something that could be tried. I don't know. It's an interesting idea. So let's look, what is the biggest predictor of mosquitoes? Oh, wow. So that really depends on the environment. So if we're talking about a really urban habitat, um, then it's going to be something like the amount of containers that are around. If we're in a very rural habitat, then it could be something else. It could be, um, are there wetlands in the area or some sort of marsh or swamp? If we're in an agricultural area, if there's rice fields, which have standing water in them, that could be, that's a major predictor of mosquitoes. So it really depends on the particular environment that we're talking about. So there's lots of different factors that can impact where we find mosquitoes. So if we look at, here's uh, two pictures from some of the, from two of the parks that we collected at. So this first picture is uh, Spurdy Park, which is a rural park. And you can see we have a path, but it's very, very um, green and lush and can't really see anything else. And that's what the whole park looks like. It's just very forested. And down here, this is an urban park. This is Goebel Park. And you can see there's a lot more grass. This one's actually right next to a highway. So there's not as many trees and things for mosquitoes to rest on. And so that, that was our hypothesis that we would actually find more mosquitoes on average in our rural parks compared to our urban parks. And that's what happens. So over the course of the summer, on average, we collected more mosquitoes at each of our rural parks. So at each of our sites in our rural parks, we collected about 900 mosquitoes from each site total. And in our urban parks, we collected about 700 mosquitoes from each site. So still a lot of mosquitoes um, in both places, but there are more total mosquitoes in our rural parks than there are in our urban parks. That being said, I'm not showing any data today about which species we found in the different types of parks. So we found more vectors of disease concerns, so mosquitoes that transmit diseases to humans in the urban parks. So that's also something we have to think about when we're thinking about where we find mosquitoes. It's which species do we find where? One of the reasons we find more mosquitoes in rural areas um, overall than in urban areas is because of trees. So if you have more canopy cover, like we see in this top picture here, there's more places for mosquitoes to rest. They're sheltered from rain and from heavy winds. And so they're more likely to survive as adults and then blood feed and make more, more larvae compared to a place like this. If a mosquito is caught out in the grassy area when it's really heavy rain, it could get hit with a lot of raindrops and then die. What would happen if mosquitoes were eradicated? 
I don't know, but I don't think we'll ever get to that, unfortunately. I think they're just too good at what they do. But it would be a great question, and it's a great area of research that you could go into if you're interested. And Dr. Lowe, did you want to talk about the tire traps? Sure, I'm happy just to mention them. Um, uh, we had our uh, meetup and do science yesterday, and I just uh, when I just talked about the the general um, assignment that they have for developing their controlled experiment using traps, I kind of set up a little bit what to listen for in your talk today, Allison. Um, but I did mention that. Um, that um, this is a, a scientist who is very interested in epidemiology and sustainability of uh, populations, uh, particularly in tropical and subtropical reasons, regions where there is endemic um, mosquitoes that uh, cause disease. And he, uh, his team specifically was looking for um, a way to um, uh, provide um, the kind of protection um, with, uh, to the community without using a lot of chemicals in a very inexpensive way. And so uh, working with his team, they developed this tire, essentially it's a tire trap. And um, you can tell already from Allison's talk, from Dr. Parker's talk, that tires are a beloved place for mosquitoes. There's all kinds of reasons why they are a preferred habitat from, if they, if, if they find them, they generally will colonize them if they've got water and the right kind of things in them. And so with that awareness, uh, they developed this tire where they, uh, tire trip, which they basically just cut the tire into three pieces and then put one piece of the tire over the other, the top of the tire. They put the water in the tire with, with some kind of bait um, they actually use a fair hormone, but you can also use some of the baits that um, Allison is going to be talking about later. And then um, the they're not collecting the data. Um, they're not collecting the mosquitoes for data like we do, but they are actually setting these traps so that the mosquitoes go to these places preferentially. And that way, the, um, the villagers know where to go to get rid of mosquitoes. And so it has it has apparently been very effective. And um, uh, this, this scientist, Dr. Ulibari, he's now uh, retired from, from teaching and he's now actually living in Mexico and working on a variety of health initiatives. And this is one of them. So yeah, thank you so much for giving me that opportunity. Um, I understand if you've got a steel bolted tire, it's not easy to chop through. Uh, but um, uh, a friend of ours, um, Dan Killingsworth, has, is, has, has found a device that can be used to chop up tires. And he's hoping to make, to make that more available to people so that they can actually make, make these tire, um, tire traps here in the US. So stay tuned for that. Thank you, Allison. I just, I don't wanna take any more of your time because what you're talking about is fascinating. And I'm learning so much. All right, so some of you might be thinking about designing your own research project looking at mosquitoes. So when we're thinking about how to design a research project about mosquitoes, the first thing you wanna do is what question are you trying to answer? So it could be something such as, are am I gonna find more mosquito larvae in containers if the container is in shade versus in the sun? And what kind of shade is it? Shade from a tree or shade from a building? Are mosquitoes attracted to different types of containers? So maybe you use a flower pot and maybe you use a flower pot saucer. So different types of containers. Maybe you use the same container, but it's different colors. So you have the same flower pots and one's brown and one's green. Maybe they're attracted to the different colors. When you're putting water in your containers, you wanna make them attractive to mosquitoes. And all you need to do to do that is put some grass clippings or some leaves into the container with the water and it'll make a really lovely, smelly, plant tea, don't drink it, but that the females are really attracted to. So maybe in one container, you put leaves from a tree in your yard and the other container, you put grass clippings in it and see is one more attractive than the other. You could do the height of the container. And so this is going back to somebody asking, well, I live in New York City. How would I do something like this? So put something on a windowsill if you have one. It could be a really little container. 
on a windowsill. And if you have a fire escape, put it on the fire escape. So is there a difference in height of where you find the containers at? If you have a multi-floor apartment you live in, could you put it on two different windowsills and see if there's a difference? So some really easy things that you can still test to see where you're finding these mosquitoes. You really have endless amounts of possibilities. And then when you're thinking about how to test your question, if you can have three, can three of the same thing happening or test it out three different times over the summer, that's gonna help you know that the data you're collecting is as accurate as possible. Think about what types of containers you're gonna use. Some of it might be what you have at home. I mean, if you have stuff at home, just use that. A lot of times, and I'll show you in, in a few slides, I use uh, takeout containers that come, like that soup comes in and things like that. And then how are you gonna make that water attractive to female mosquitoes, putting different plants in it? You could try something like, what if I put some rocks in it versus grass? You could put things like fish food, or if you have a pet at home, put the pet food in one and just have water in the other. Is the pet food as it kind of breaks down, is that attractive to mosquitoes? You have so many different options of things you can try to put into the water just to see if females will even be attracted to it. Mm -hmm. And what data and, uh, are you going to I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Allison. I just wanted to say that um, everyone has access to the paper you published um, in 2020 uh, that talks about your trapping experiments. And I think that's also very useful. But I, before I forget, I just wanted to mention, it's really good to put rocks in your trap unless you have something heavy like a tire, because if there's wind or an animal, they can easily be tipped over. So um, anyway, rocks are a good thing. Thanks. And if you don't have rocks like marbles or, or anything like that, you can put in the bottom. And what data are you collecting? Are you going to look at the number of eggs that are laid? Are you going to look at the number of larvae in your containers? And how often are you going to check it? Are you going to check it every day, once a week? And then how are you going to analyze your data? So um, one place to go for a resource is the Erin Neon Flexible Learning Projects. Um, so if you go to this link down at the bottom, um, you can click on one that is mosquito uh, surveys along anthropogenic impact gradients. And so this was a lab that I developed where it has a bunch of different materials for you to use. So there's some background on mosquitoes, how to build a mosquito emergence trap, which we see here. Um, you put the larvae and pupae down in the bottom and then the adults emerge and fly up. Uh, ask your parents if you're in high school to make sure they're okay with you doing this. Um, there's a take home supply kit that tells you what you need to build this. Um, and then taxon taxonomic keys so you can identify your mosquitoes to species, but you also have the Globe Observer app to help you with that. And then there's two different experiments that I walk you through. So one is um, a female oviposition choice experiment. And oviposition is the word we use for egg laying when we're talking about insects. Um, and there's instructor and student lab manuals and a data collection sheet. Um, and your experiment can be something as simple as this. So this was what I was talking about, my uh, takeout containers from ordering food during COVID. Um, you know, just some water in here, and you can see it's a little bit of a darker color. I actually put some fish flakes from fish food in there and a popsicle stick, and that's all you need. And then you can go and look at the eggs on the popsicle stick and if there's any egg grafts on the surface of the eggs. And that, that's it. It could be that small. It doesn't need to be big. You'll still see um, mosquitoes come. The other one is looking at mosquito diversity along an anthropogenic or human dominated land use gradient. And this is a little bit of a bigger experiment, but it could give you some ideas of things to do. It talks you through some of the same things in this first experiment because you need minimum mosquito eggs for your project. But it has the manuals again, a data collection sheet you can use, um, and then it has instructions on how to analyze the data if you want to do it. Um, and then there's also instructions on how to accent, access NEON data. So if you're not able to actually go out and collect data on your own, or say you're in a place where there's a mosquito disease outbreak and you don't really want to be interacting with mosquitoes, you can use this data that other scientists have collected from around the United States on mosquitoes. And I also have some simplified data in a different folder for you to look at. So all of this information is in, um, um, on, on Google for you. And it's all free. 
um, and just use that as some background information. But here's an example of a project some of my students did. So um, they looked at, their question was, how does the volume of water in the same containers impact or overposition or egg laying choice? And they were looking specifically at Culex mosquitoes. So they were collecting the egg rafts, like we can see right here on this paintbrush. And so what they did is they decided they wanted to have water volume as their thing they're testing. And so they, we had five gallons, which are about 19 liters um, containers that we bought from the hardware store. And at each of our sites, we had three containers and you could do this with two containers if you wanted to, but we did six liters, 12 liters and 18 liters. And we went and collected the egg rafts every day for 12 weeks, even on the weekends because the mosquitoes don't care that it's the weekend. And for the eggs, they'll hatch if you don't collect them every day. And then you don't know how many egg rafts you have. And then you have mosquito larvae. And I don't think anybody wants to have extra mosquitoes around where they live. And what we did is you can see in these containers, this water is really dark looking. So what we did is we just put some grass clippings. We actually measured out how much grass, but you know, you could just guess or say, I'm going to fill up this cup with grass or with leaves. And I'm going to use the same container every time I'm putting this plant into our containers. And so we had this grass infusion that is very attracted to the mosquitoes. And then if we actually look at our results, we see that the females really did not like our six liter bucket, which you can see here, it has the least amount of water. And they preferred to lay their eggs in these larger amounts of water in the 12 and 18 liters. And so this is an example of a project that you can do in your own backyard. If you don't have a backyard, you know, like I said, you could do things like with different heights, or if you just have one windowsill, do different, do two different types of plants, or you can do different volumes of water in the same containers on a windowsill, for example. So those are just some, that's one example of a project um, that you can do. Well, in this case, we were looking at the egg rafts because those were the easiest for us to collect. And with that, I will take any questions. And these are some of my students doing research. Um, here's a mosquito larvae under a microscope. So they have these cool hairs. And here's some male mosquitoes. And I fed them different color sugar sources. So they have different colors in their stomachs. So that's a great question. For your experiments, would you have to replenish the bait? So that's up to you. So if you wanted to replenish the bait, then make sure you do it for the whole experiment. And then you wanna keep, you wanna mark on your container where that level is. So you can always just add it as it evaporates. If you decide I'm not gonna replenish the bait, then make sure that you do that over the course of your experiment. But if you're doing something like the volume of water, like we were doing, we, we replenish the baits. So you can even see down here, we have a little mark that tells us where the six liters of water were. And this, this bucket over here was actually our extra bait. So we could just dump more in as we needed it. How smart are mosquitoes? Will they ever figure out these traps and avoid them? No, they won't because the females are looking for the best place for their offspring. And in this case, this is just a kind of a container that could have been out in anybody's yard unattended. So they're not realizing that we're actually taking the eggs out because the females lay their eggs and they fly away and they're gone and they don't think about those eggs ever again. How do you collect egg rafts from buckets? So the way that you collect an egg raft from a bucket is you take a paintbrush, or you can even do it with a, something like a popsicle stick or a chopstick. So all you do is you take your paintbrush and put it down underneath the egg raft and then slowly pull up. And then the egg raft, like you see in this picture here, can actually sit right on the top of the paintbrush. And then you could use that to count them. And then you could just toss them into the grass or onto the street or in the garbage can, and then they'll die. So then you won't be having any more mosquitoes around you. Can we use different kinds of natural bait? Rice, water, sugar, water. Yeah, you can use whatever you want. That's the coolest thing about these projects is whatever you are interested in testing, you can do. So you could put rice water and sugar water and vinegar in a container if you want and see, are mosquitoes attracted to these? And if they are, which ones do they like better than others? Are different kinds of bait 
more effective in different climates. So it's not that they're necessarily more effective in different climates. Different types of bait is, are going to be more attractive to different types of mosquitoes. And so it really depends on the mosquito species that you have in your area. And then that will depend on what types of baits are more attractive. And different species of mosquitoes are attracted to different types of baits. So, so it, can, it just depends on what you have around you. Are there any other questions? These were all great questions. All right, well, thank you so much for coming and listening. And if you ever have questions about mosquitoes, even if it has nothing to do with this program, um, feel free to email me. Here's my email address down here, parkera10 at nku.edu. And I am more than happy to help you this summer if you have questions about a project or if you find a mosquito and you're not sure what it is, take a picture and send it to me. I'm, I'm here to help you use me as a resource. So Dr. Parker, I wanna thank you on behalf of the people who are on this call. We had a record number of people attending this session today. And um, I think a lot of people here are gonna be interested in using this, this approach with their students, as well as our, as our CS interns who are now thinking about the different kinds of projects that they can do. So um, you've been so generous with your interest and time. And I wanna point out that that, um, the link, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the neon link that, uh, that Dr. Parker gave us is, you know, is a project that she created um, with NSF funding. And um, it has a lot of really good resources in it. And I really hope you'll have a chance to take a look at it. So if there are no other questions, um, I wanna just thank you again, uh, Allison. It's been great to see you. Um, I know that she's heartfelt when she says, you know, if you've got a question, please reach out because she's one of the most approachable scientists I know. So thanks. And we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Yeah, thank you so much.